Hi everyone, well our unbelievably warm fall continues and it's bringing all sorts of surprises every day here. So today a red-winged blackbird showed up at my bird feed, this has never happened before, and evening grosbeaks have been spotted all over the place here and finally today I saw them in my backyard as well. Some of them were checking out my bird feeders. Most of them were just feeding on trees all around here. Stay tuned, David has prepared a report on why this is happening now. And as you might know, uh, we encourage everyone to keep their dead trees up on their property if it's not dangerous. Um, and for the past few days, we've had a pileated woodpecker coming to peck all sorts of things on one of the spruce trees that's dying on our property. The tree's gonna stay there for a while because it's not in a dangerous spot. Earlier this spring, we had to take down three poplars. They were rotting and they were way too close to power lines. We took them down before the nesting season. We cut them up and even though we can't use them for firewood, I still keep them on my property. I kind of make a decorative wall next to my brush pile and I grow some native plants there as well. And that's where we see all sorts of woodpeckers come and check things out and obviously find more food even though we think that those logs are all dead and done. Earlier this spring, Lison McNeil took a picture of a mysterious bird that showed up in the suburbs of Toronto. No one there had ever seen a bird like that, and it wasn't shy at all. Hi, listen. While you're not far off with your guess of a quail for your mystery bird that appeared in your suburban yard an hour east of Toronto, the bird's called a chucker, and it's a type of partridge. It was not always found in North America. They originally came from Eurasia, from Eastern Europe to China. The first chuckers were brought to our continent in the early 1890s, and in the mid-20th century, nearly a million birds were released in more than 40 U.S. states and six Canadian provinces, so they could be hunted as a game bird. The introductions didn't succeed everywhere, though, but they did work well on steep mountain slopes in the west east of the Rockies. What makes your bird so interesting is that you saw it in southern Ontario, far away from its ranges depicted in various field guides, which tells me that it's likely either a single escapee or a bird deliberately released from a game farm for the purposes of a hunt. Every once in a while one shows up in Ontario or Quebec. That would also explain its tameness. What's really interesting about chuckers is that where they actually breed, they form large communal groups also known as creches of up to 100 young birds with about 10 to 12 adults babysitting them. As for your bird's future, likely not good. Standing out in the environment so obviously, such birds are often picked off by various predators such as feral cats, foxes, and birds of prey. As for catching it yourself to take it to a local wildlife rehabilitation center, don't bother unless you've got a lot of time on your hands. Do you grow annuals and herbs in like flower pots and hanging baskets? Um, I do. And what do you do with all the earth after the flowers have died? Well, this year I've had so many pots and baskets that I decided to build another garden bed with all the earth that we used to, to have those baskets. So I dumped everything into the bed and then I mixed it all up with the dead leaves because they're wonderful fertilizer. Another thing that I've been doing with dead leaves this fall is I've been covering our garden, our vegetable beds with them and then kind of mulching it all together, pouring a little bit of water because those leaves are an incredible fertilizer and I bet there will be tons of birds on those beds early in the spring next year. Well, it might not rival the super flight that took place in the winter of 2020-21. It looks like it's going to be a big year for seeing boreal finches at our feeders in southern Canada and northern U.S. We can expect to see lots of red poles, gross beaks, siskins, purple finches, and crossbills. And in some places, they'll be joined by blue jays, red-breasted nuthatches, and bohemian waxwings. And what do all of these songbirds have in common? Well, they all love to eat the fruits and seeds of mostly coniferous trees, but also some deciduous trees that are found in the expansive forests of Canada and the U.S. But we must keep in mind that this food supply is cyclical. In other words, it's not always there. Here's how it works. During mast years, when the trees are especially heavily laden with cones, seeds, and fruits, the various boreal finches enjoy plentiful food. And as long as the winter in the boreal forest is not too harsh, with chilly temperatures and deep snow, 
they choose not to migrate south. But every three or four years or so, those trees in the boreal forest forego producing any cone seeds and fruits. The trees do this to thwart the squirrels, which also love to eat those foods. If the trees did not undergo that barren year causing a mass crop failure, then the squirrels would simply continue to consume all of the seeds and fruits each and every year and the trees would never get the chance to replenish themselves. It's during those mass crop failures that the boreal finches have no choice but to head south to find alternative foods or starve to death. Those winters with abundant boreal forest songbirds at our feeders are called eruptions. Now it's a bit more complex than that if only because there are several species of trees, deciduous and coniferous in various regions in North America south of the boreal forest uh, that can also produce heavy crops of cone seeds and or fruits that our boreal finches like to feed on. And their availability can also locally attract birds like jays, nuthatches and waxwings. But once the birds deplete those natural foods in late fall and winter, they then head to our feeders. As for a heavy presence of evening gross beaks in any given winter, things are further complicated by the fact that these birds also like to eat spruce budworms. And if there's a big crop of this food in any given year, it'll mean plenty of these striking birds eventually showing up at our feeders when the budworms disappear. I hope that this is clear enough to understand. Wild turkey is such a North American symbol. These non-migratory birds can be found in southern Canada, in 48 U.S. states, including Hawaii and in Mexico. They belong to the pheasant family, which means in the old days they were hunted heavily in some areas to the point of extinction. But thanks to some enormous conservation efforts, did you know that there's actually the National Wild Turkey Federation? Wild turkeys are back and abundant. Here we see them everywhere. Just the other day, I stopped my car to take a couple of videos of them eating something on one of the farmer's fields around here. And a few years back, a female out of nowhere flew into my car and left a significant dent on the hood. She was fine, I wasn't driving uh, too fast, but what a silly bird. We also get a lot of pictures and videos and, say, and we see this here of wild turkeys feeding under our bird feeders. Of course, the funniest videos are the ones of them trying to eat at our squirrel busters. We've actually called our feeders turkey busters because, of course, turkeys are too large to eat at our bird feeders. Their diet is mostly plant matter. You know, they love tubers and acorns and nuts and berries and grains and corn. But as tempting as it is, please do not feed wild turkeys. They might act tame around you, but they're actually rather aggressive, especially during their breeding season, and they have been known to attack humans. It is recommended to shoo them away as soon as they show up somewhere close to your living area. Who knows why wild turkeys are called wild turkeys? Well, there are two theories. So first, when the Spanish brought the domesticated wild turkeys from here to, to Europe, the Brits thought that it was the Turkish merchants that brought those birds, because at that time, a lot of goods were coming from Turkey. And the second theory is actually before the Americas were discovered, it was the Turkish merchants that used to import wild West African fowl into Britain. The Brits actually called that bird uh, turkey cock. So naturally, when uh, British settlers came here and they saw a larger version of that West African fowl, they just used the same name, the turkey cock. And then later on, the name got abbreviated to just turkey. Funny enough, in many other languages, including my native Russian, the turkey's name is derived from India because Columbus went to discover West Indies, so naturally a bird from his trip was an Indian bird. Wild turkeys are super territorial, that's why it's not a good idea to feed them, and hierarchies are established both between males and between females. They're super social, that's why you don't see a lone turkey that often. And for birds of such a large size, they actually sleep perched on the branch in trees, though females actually nest on the ground. 
Females only have one brood per season, but she can lay up to 20 eggs. And 24 hours after chicks hatch, they can actually move around and feed. Though, believe it or not, wild turkeys only live on average up to a year and a half. That's it, that's all for now. Our photo contest is still open. It's yellow birds. I hope you'll get to see some evening grosbeaks around your feeders as well. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.